Hey there, everybody. I want to give you a shot in the arm today with some real talk. You know, you can count on me for that. So he, our guest today said this to me before we went live and I had to write it down. So I'm just going to say it. The more you lead, the more lonely you get. I want to let that sink in because I've known that my whole life. And I always used to say it's lonely at the top. But the more you lead, the more lonely you get. And I just, I couldn't be happier to have you here today, Dr. Kelly Flanagan. Thank you for thank joining you. me. Uh, thank you for having me, Lisa. <laughs> Can't wait for this conversation. Oh my gosh. I just, I wish people could know um, so much, but let me, I'm just going to start straight off and let everyone know why you want to pay attention to this today. Because Dr. Flanagan has this amazing book, True Companions. And to be honest with you, I read the study guide. I have all my notes. I actually couldn't get through the whole book because I got stuck on a spot we're going to talk today about, and it was about loneliness. And I was honest with him and said, you know, I really wanted to finish it. And I got stuck and I'm not turning this into a therapy session, right? This is an interview, uh, but I'm going to bring my stories into it. Like that's how we roll. Right. So um, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about what Dr. Kelly Flanagan's bringing to us today, because you don't want to miss a minute of this. It's, it's game changing on every level of every relationship, if you're willing to lean into it. So let me tell you why, okay? And I'm going to read this because I don't want to miss it. So Dr. Kelly Flanagan is a psychologist, author, consultant, and speaker who enjoys walking with people through three essentials of, truly, of a truly satisfying life, worthiness, belonging, and purpose. Let's just say that as you are all listening into this podcast, as leaders in tech, I know you want all of this or you wouldn't be doing what you're doing. His blog writings, which is how I found him years ago, by the way, his blog writings have been featured in Reader's Digest, The Huffington Post, The Five Love Languages, and The Today Show. Kelly's the author of Lovable. And in 2021, his second book, True Companions, <gasps> debuted as an Amazon number one new release in several categories related to friendship, marriage, and ethics. I want to talk about this in just two seconds, uh, Kelly, because I think I really want to land it so people lean into this because they're like true companions, leaders in tech, control out the lead. What's going on? No, no, no. Friendship, marriage, ethics. We're talking about exactly what goes on at work and in your life. And if you want to be a leader that isn't burning out, that is energized, being present for the moments that matter, having high performance teams and living the life that you dream of, this episode is for you. And I just, I'm just going to land it there. And um, Kelly, let me ask you about the quote you, when I wrote your quote down, I will remember it forever, right? The more you lead, the more lonely you get. Like, let's start there. What is it about yeah. companions and lonely and loneliness and leadership? Yeah, well, um, I'm <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> well, I, I, I got to tell you a story to start out because, oh, yeah. and it's a story about the way we use words because lonely is a, is a strong word. It's a, it's a word with a lot of connotation for lots of people. Um, so I was um, counseling a couple 10, 15 years ago. They came in one night and they were fighting tooth and nail and uh, about something. And I, you know, I sat them down and we revisited some of the tools we were using to communicate. So they started slowly going through this big fight they were having, which turned out to be about whether or not to put a TV in the living room. Mm. Um, and, uh, and so I'm listening to them closely speaking and, and it suddenly dawns on me and I stopped him and I said to the husband, I said, can you, can you tell me, can you describe in detail the living room? And he started to describe it and his wife stopped him and said, that's not the living room. That's the family room. You can put a TV in there. I don't care. Um, <laughs> and, and I think, I think that when we use the word lonely, a lot of people think of a room inside of themselves that is decorated with three really painful human experiences, abandonment, mm -hmm. shame, and rejection. Abandonment being someone leaving us painfully, mm -hmm. shame being someone telling us we're not worthy of love and belonging, which creates, can, can sometimes trigger feelings of loneliness. And then isolation is physical sense that there's nobody, nobody around paying attention. Mm -hmm. Those are, those are three painful and broken human experiences that we need to address and work through and release. But when I say lonely, when I say loneliness, I'm describing an entirely different room inside of us. It's a room that contains your uniqueness, the things about you that only you can understand that no one else is ever going to get, no matter how much a spouse loves you or an employee adores you there are parts of you that no one is going to understand. Um, and there's parts of you that no one else can access. It's in the center of you. No one else can get in there. You're, you're alone by yourself in there. Um, and, and so the reality is we all have 
an experience of loneliness that is tied to those parts of us. Um, and we do a lot of damage in our relationships trying to convince people to, you know, you got to take my loneliness away from me rather than learning how to just, right, mm-hmm. move toward, embrace, and befriend that that part of us. Um, but I think it's it's even truer for leaders. I mean, the the further you get into a position that fewer and fewer people understand or that you're even allowed to explain to people because you have information and, and, um, and ideas that you can't share with people, the lonelier and lonelier you get. By definition, your experience is becoming more and more rare and more and more unique. Um, and I think that's a painful, I think that's a painful thing for leaders. Um, that's why you see leaders wanting to connect with other leaders who understand what it's like to be lonely, frankly. Um, and that's one of the messages of true companions is that instead of trying to, 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 to get people to take our loneliness away from us or eliminate it, what if we just decided to share our loneliness with each other? Um, and ironically, in the process of sharing our loneliness, hey, this is what it's like to be me and be lonely. This is what it's like to be you and be lonely. All of a sudden, we feel a little bit less alone in the world. Mm-hmm. And so I love the idea of leaders coming together and saying, it's lonely here. Um, what's it like to be lonely in you as a leader? And all of a sudden, you feel a little bit less alone. Do you find... So what was fascinating for me in reading the book, and I, you know, extroverted thinker here. So everyone, everyone yeah. knows how I roll <laughs> when I talk. I had a moment of I think there were many times as a leader, I never called it lonely. Like I knew to say, yeah, I had, especially because I was also um, parts of mergers and acquisitions, and I had mm. all kinds of stuff I couldn't talk about. So that was just like part of the job. Yeah, but I never, I, I never labeled it as lonely. And I wonder what that would have done. I mean, now when I coach executives, I'm clear on it. Like you went that one of the things I talked about with you is getting stuck in loneliness, right? right. But I'm just curious, um, what are the, the signs or symptoms that something could be classified as lonely and part of, I think you called it humans being human or um, mm-hmm. it was all yeah. these quotes I have of yours. I would love to unpack that a little bit more if we could so that people that are experiencing this can actually label it accurately. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it gets mislabeled or misunderstood. Yeah. I mean, I think you just said the word. I think a feeling that you're being misunderstood, that people don't get you. Mm-hmm. Um, um, okay. I think a feeling that people don't trust your heart for them. Mm-hmm. You know, as a leader, you're trying to m- make decisions that are in the best interest of everyone. And so a lot of times they aren't in the perfect interest of anyone. <laughs> and And so people can feel... You know, are you really trying to take care of me? Are you really trying to do what's in the best interest of everybody here? Um, and and so that that's a very painful sort of loneliness to to feel like your 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 intentions aren't trusted, um, yeah. and uh, and your leadership isn't um, isn't trusted. So, and and frankly, a lot of leaders will get into patterns of trying to defend their leadership as a result, which becomes a destructive, toxic thing within the company or the organization or a family. Um, and so instead to just be able to, to learn how to abide with your own sense of loneliness um, and to know that it's, it's okay to not sway the opinions of other people. It's okay to, to stay open-hearted to them anyways, instead of defensive um, and to stay open-hearted to yourself and, uh, and know that, that your, your loneliness isn't saying something bad about you. And it's just saying that you're, you're human and in a, in a position as a human being where you're more likely to feel loneliness than not. Wow. You know, I think of all the epidemic of medication being taken mm. and, you know, the burnout culture, you know, my phrase is always the always on never good enough will replace you tomorrow or today yeah. in some cases in tech yeah. and how lonely it is to live with that frame of reference already. And then the medication that goes on top because Oh, you're anxious. Oh, you're depressed. You know, Mm. imagine a world where you're like, wait, I'm lonely and I'm going to take care of myself and I'm going to make sure I'm okay and whole so that I can then be the best leader, spouse, parent, friend, you know, that's, you just, Lisa, you're amazing because you just named the empowering thing about this concept of embracing our loneliness because it sounds a little disempowering at first. Like I'm just supposed to accept that I'm I'm lonely and that's what it's like to be human. Mm-hmm. But as long as you're holding everyone else responsible for your loneliness, you're also assigning them the responsibility for taking care of you. Um, oh. And right, and when you when you're doing that, like yeah. care feels like the scarcest resource in the world. But but when you say, oh wait. I'm responsible for my own sense of loneliness. I'm responsible for my own self-care. 
then you can care for yourself abundantly. There's no end to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, I think it's, it was chapter six or seven in, in True Companions, I talk about the process, the hero's journey we go on to befriend our loneliness. Mm-hmm. And the reward you reap from that is the capacity to care for yourself in deep and rich ways. I mean, where were you when I was in the emergency room thinking I'm having a heart attack, my friend? <laughs> Probably like, in my own emergency room, oh. learning learning all of this myself oh, the hard way. I mean, yeah. So for those of you that, um, well, you're all going to go get this book 100%. I know this because it changes everything. But what I want to say is what I really appreciate about you, Kelly, so much is that you share your own journey here. This isn't like an academic book where you sat around and ran research and you tell everybody 67% of the blah, blah, blahs, right? No, this is like, hey, been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Yeah. And I think um, that's how I was able. So you just called me amazing for getting it. The reason I think I got it in part was because I read your book. And yeah. well, as much as I could of the, the main one, but I, all study guide, I've done it all. Yeah. And the reason I really want to highlight that is I didn't have a lens. I, it's not even a lens. I didn't have a language for it before. Now I have always known that Listen, I rebooted in tech, took a medical leave, and then went back because I knew I was making choices. I was clear enough that if I just left, I would forever have the what if. Yep. And I knew that if I went back in and I changed my own situation, that I could then really, you know, I'd be a detective in my own world. So one of your things you talk about being curious, right? Yes. I got just super damn curious about myself. And I realized you know what, whose rules am I playing by? And am I even trying to change them? And I was in a leadership position. I mean, I had, I had plenty of people that I could delegate to and through plenty of budget, you know, plenty of visibility. And yet I'm burning out. So I'm thinking, yeah. And you know what? It was really lonely. Yes. And I kept feeling like I was broken and I kept thinking, why am I not more productive? Why am I foggy brained? I feel pissed off all the time. Why do I keep getting bronchitis? You know, why is everybody around me so stupid? I, I swear to you, I think you could see it in my face. There were times, yeah. Kelly, I would hide in offices and call in. This is before Zoom land, right? Or in right. Mobile X. I would just do phone only because I knew my face was telling you what I thought. Even though I think um, in your book, you call it, I want to find it really quick. There's like mm. nine core ways, right? Yes. I was um, peace faking. Yes. Let's talk, let's talk about peace faking for a second because sure. that just showed up like organically. Yeah. I'll just talk, talk about that for a second because damn, I was doing that. Well, you're speaking to the, the, the middle part of, of true companions in which I sort of lay out what I see as the nine core protections that we bring to relationships. Um, and we, if we bring them to one relationship, we bring them to all of our relationships. So, you know, it's, we, we've have, we have our favorite go-tos and one of them I call peace faking, which is, is what oftentimes we assume is peacemaking. So peace faking is sort of staying quiet not having a voice and not having an opinion for the sake of maintaining harmony in a relationship or in a setting. Um, but in reality, that's peace faking. It's, it's faking who you are in order to keep a certain sort of tenuous and unsatisfying peace. But deep peace and deep peacemaking is about everyone having, being a stakeholder, having a voice, um, being able to show up with their true self and figuring out together, you know, it, it might create a little more tension. There'll be hard conversations, there'll be conflict, but now we're actually creating a wholeness amongst us um, and we'll rise together if we can do that. Um, and so the potential is unlimited when we're engaged in true peacemaking. I, I see this in teams every day. Yeah. I see this in my own marriage sometimes. Yeah, I absolutely. see this in my relationship with friends. Yep. And it's, it was so profound to me. I think that's why it showed up right now. So if you, mm-hmm. I just want everybody to think about what is something that you're acting like it's okay when it's really not. What is, mm-hmm. think about all those ideas you have on innovating something in tech. Think about another yep. meeting you think you don't even need to go to, but you show up half checked in. Think mm-hmm. about, you know, the, te- the, which room are you putting the TV in for crying out loud? <laughs> that's right? right. That's right. How, how many homemade dinners should you make in the middle of a pandemic? Right. Right. Um, what are you not speaking up about? Because I, for me, I think that was very lonely and yes. I absolutely felt misunderstood and it caused so much resentment. And I think it also led to coping through food. 
Mm-hmm. And so, okay, I'll just smile and go get another bag of Doritos. I, I didn't need Doritos. I honestly, listen, <laughs> Starbucks. Okay, Starbucks, pumpkin loaf. All right. <laughs> Can't do it. If I get I one, it. it doesn't stop. That's great. Um, yeah. Oh my gosh. So, okay. Let me ask you this because I, I know there's so much here to unpack. Mm-hmm. Why don't you talk us through the, the three basic components of trip yeah. companionship because i know i'm all over the map of the popcorn trail which means they have to read it but i think fundamentally awesome. you, you build for a reason and i'd love for them um to better understand you know the evolution if you will yeah of becoming a true companion and honestly i i know you don't say it on top here but it's to yourself first it is to yourself first right? yeah. yeah yeah um yeah that i mean so the, the in my book lovable I wrote letters to my kids and bookended every part of the book with a letter to my kids. And in this book, I do the same thing, except I write those letters to my wife. And actually the, the first the first letter in the book, which um, opens the loneliness part of the book is a letter entitled, um, before I can belong to you, I have to belong to myself, you know? And so that's that concept is, is pretty much at the core of, um, of the loneliness piece. Um, I would like to I want to go. It's okay if I go back and then oh, go, go through go through the three. Okay. You're having sitting there. If we were together, we'd be drinking our coffee. Hey. I wouldn't have the pumpkin loaf, and we'd just. Be- <laughs> there you go. You go. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Well, so I wrote a book called Lovable that was about overcoming our shame, embracing our worthiness, um, and finding belonging by showing up authentically in the world and seeing who celebrates it. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's two there's two ways that true companions flows from that. Um, the first, the first is that I wanted to find a book about not just finding belonging. I wanted to write a book about building that belonging into something that can endure. It's one thing to find the people you belong to. It's another thing to build yeah. a sort of companionship that can see you all through everything, anything, right? So mm-hmm. that was one. But the other big one, and the reason this book starts with loneliness, is I found myself after the publishing of Lovable, um, it was it was it came out of a culmination of my journey of overcoming my shame and through publishing it and uh, beginning to introduce it to the world, I felt my shame diminishing more and more. I, I, be, I really had a much more steady sense of my own worthiness and value. And then, it, but something really disorienting happened, which is I was feeling just as lonely as ever. And I, and, and I started to say to myself, wait, wait a second. I thought when, when I quit feeling ashamed, I'd quit feeling lonely. Right. It's uh. like, yeah, my lo- shame's shame is shrinking. Loneliness is lingering. What's going on here? And I couldn't find anybody who wrote about them as two separate things. Everyone sort of assumes mm-hmm. that they're one and the same, and I know that they're not. And uh, and so um, I realized that I needed to I needed to write about this idea that our loneliness and our shame are separate. And our shame we do want to diminish, but our loneliness will last forever. Um, is what I wanted to talk about. And um, and so one of the ways I, I try to help people distinguish that for anybody who's listening, you're like, well, what's the difference between the two? Yeah. Um, so if you were to complete the sentence, I feel lonely because blank. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes shame is everything that completes the rest of the sentence. I feel lonely because I'm too talkative. I feel lonely because I'm not pretty enough. I feel lonely because, you know, I don't have enough engineer, (laughs) not an engineer. Like we can come up with, yeah, there you go. (laughs) Yeah. And so, you know, um, and so our shame actually is weaponized loneliness. It takes our loneliness and then it turns it back on ourselves and says, it's, you know, it creates a toxicity about it. But if we can separate the two Mm -hmm. and we can just recognize that it's, it's a pretty lonely thing to be human, to be walking around inside of skin no one else can get into and, and, and you're all alone in there and, and, no, and no one's ever going to totally understand it. Um, then if we can know that and embrace that um, and get to know ourselves better in the context of our loneliness, then we'll quit doing damage to our relationships by asking our relationships to fix our loneliness or take it away. So that's the first part of True mm-hmm. Companions is that journey into our loneliness um, and the capacity to, 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 to be present in our companionship as lonely people um, who are talking about loneliness but not trying to fix it for each other. Um, and then the second piece of True Companions is this idea that, um, that even once we've embraced our loneliness, we, ha- we all have habits of protecting ourselves in relationships. So we deeply, I mean, we deeply wanna connect with each other. We came into the world with what I call a connective self. 
But when that connective self got hurt, we built a protective self around it um, to, to protect that part of us that wants to connect. So we're showing up as two people in relationships all the time. I, I tell people at, at, at marriage retreats, you know, they say that when you get married to become one, as, but the problem is before that you were both two people. Like you were both a connective self and a protective self, right? And so we have to be conscious of and aware that as we are trying to deepen our companionship with people, that we are, we are working at cross purposes with ourselves. We want to connect with them, but we're also habitually constantly protecting, peace faking being one of those protections. Can you and say so, that again? That's so important. Sure, I'm not, yeah. I know I just, I did, we just got to do that again. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we have two. I don't even think I can say it because I was taking it all in. Sure. We're at odds with ourselves or with each other because well, it's protective and protective. That's the thing is we think we're at odds with each other, but we're really at odds with ourselves. I, um, I, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Cool. We think we think you're the problem because we're not getting along. But in reality, the, the main issue for each of us is that, yes, we're in this relationship because we want to connect. Um, but I also am constantly habitually protecting. So I'm working at cross purposes with myself. I want to connect with you, but I feel I, I have, have habits of protection to keep myself safe that I'm constantly enacting. And so in companionship, what you have is two people who have mutually agreed to take responsibility for their own protections and to quit using them. You know, rather than going here, oh, here, here's your, here's your protections. You need to go quit using them and fix them. We actually both like, it's that whole, you know, you get three fingers pointing back at you. Oh. You know, it's like, it's like, oh, I, I'll do my part mm -hmm. to be aware of, observe and quit acting from my protections and you'll do your part. Mm -hmm. And together we can trust that the companionship will take care of itself if we can do that. Um, I've never thought about it as protecting until right now. I mean, I read it, right. I think I just, it, it just dropped yep. into my soul when you said that because every time i'm judgy every time i'm every time fear based every time i'm resentful work home parenting whatever i think what i'm hearing you say and please tell me if i'm misunderstanding it because it's so important that there's a protection that's fueling yeah that. you're protecting yourself from being yeah you're you're proactively protecting yourself from being diminished by others yeah by yeah. by doing those things we, we're all doing it. i do it all the time i mm -hmm. i don't want to tell you the things i observed <laughs> in the last 24 hours i mean it's right. horrendous well you're like welcome uh, to the i call it the earthly curriculum the human that's, experience right that's right yeah so I, we can stay curious there's hope right if, if we, we can, can stay yeah, that's right yeah. if we can stay mm -hmm. curious and observant and mm -hmm. non-judgmental of our own protections they're not bad we needed them at some point or we wouldn't mm -hmm. have created you know built them or we wouldn't have used them and so just non-judgmental and recognize them and, and once we recognize them instead of acting from them we choose to act in a connective way instead yeah. um, so that's the second part of, Love of it. True yeah. thank you thank you for the yep. double click on that yep so yep. okay there's the loneliness then there's the protecting yep and yep connecting. Mm -hmm. it, Yep. And then the last, you know, if, if I had to say, like, if I had to sum it up, I'd say that true companions redeems for our relationship, three parts of the human experience, loneliness, protectiveness, and our temporariness. Wow. Yeah. You know, um, this, the, the, the temporary reality of our lives, which we spend so much time trying not to think about and, and sort of avoiding. Um, but there's this really, there's this really interesting way that we are not neurologically wired um, to actually uh, neglect and take for granted our companions. Um, and so for me, this, this neurological wiring plays a large role in how we end up getting our lives out of balance and get burnt out. So this is it. So it's a psychological term called habituation. And what habituation is, is basically you're neurologically wired that if a stimulus is repeated to you over and over again, and, and you consider it safe, then your brain uh, takes back resources from paying attention to it and frees up those resources for paying attention to things that could be more threatening or more of an emergency. So for instance, you and I, we got dressed this morning mm -hmm. and for the first few minutes we felt our clothes, um, right, but, yeah. your, but your brain at one point said, it's there, it's constant, it's safe. And we quit feeling our clothes so a couple minutes after we put them on. We habituated to the sensation. It's what happens when you you light a candle in a room and you enjoy it for 10 minutes and then you don't smell it anymore. And someone else walks into the room and says, oh, it smells amazing in here. And you're like, 
Oh, yeah, that's I guess fascinating. It's, yeah, it's yeah. habitu- hitch habituation. So here's the thing. This is a huge backhanded <laughs> compliment to your companions. That, it, <laughs> that if you're taking them for granted, it's because your 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 brain has deemed them constant and safe. Okay. I'm gonna tell my husband this one. He's yes. Love it. <laughs> this will get this will get you out of the doghouse a little bit. Um, say it again. You have to say that again. Yeah. It, it, it's a backhanded <laughs> compliment to your companions. If mm-hmm. if you are taking them for granted, it's because you've deemed them constant and safe. You're you're neurologically wired <sighs> to take them for granted, right? This um, makes so much sense. Well, you know, it like makes I so much sense. It's it's uh, it, it, we're working. We're mm-hmm. I mean, it's a really good way we're wired. You're you're your nervous system is designed to free up its attention for things that could be dangerous, right? Which is why you're more inclined to focus on the next crisis, the next stressor, the next responsibility than you are on your people. And this is how we get way down the road toward burnout and skewed in that direction. Um, And so there's a great line of research by uh, this researcher, this psychologist, her name is Laura Karstensen at, uh, at Stanford. And I read about this research in a book called Being Mortal um, mm. by Atul, Atul Gawande. I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, and the research basically showed um, that for the most part on autopilot, um, our minds are, and values are oriented towards expansion, achievement, accumulation, and these sorts of values. Mm-hmm. And that there's essentially only one perspective on life that automatically guarantees a more balanced approach that causes you to, to want to and to value ordinary everyday pleasures, presence, and deepening your connections with your existing companions. And that, and that perspective, as she describes it, is the priming of our fragility, the awareness that we are temporary and fragile, this thing that we normally just don't want to pay much attention to. If we can actually welcome it in and harness it to reorient us towards our people, it will actually keep us in balance by default, and we will be much less likely to to, to find ourselves skewed in the direction of, of burnout. Um, but it requires an intentionality to be oriented toward that perspective and to be aware of our own fragility. Now, right now, I'd say... Um, some of life in general is priming us to our fragility, right? I mean, mm-hmm. we're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, <laughs> we know how precarious things can be. Um, and that's one thing that that Carsonson found was around sort of major cultural events like 9-11 or the SARS epidemic, mm-hmm. you would see even very young people get more aware of their values around companionship mm-hmm. and presence and closeness. But then as those things pass, generally the population starts to move back, except for the elderly, their horizon is approaching. And so this is why you see the elderly more focused on presence and everyday pleasures. It's not because they're old, it's because their fragility is primed. Um, and so if you can can be consciously priming your fragility even earlier in life, you'll keep your life in better balance. I, I heard everything you said, and I'm also having almost an out-of-body experience at the same time. This mm. is I think this is game changer for anybody. Mm. If you if you could just hear that part again, right? So mm. what I recognized, so I became a parent late in life. I, I had mm. six years of infertility. I was a yeah. career woman. I waited really long to get married. You know, the whole thing, right? Mm-hmm. And there was a song. It's called You're Gonna Miss This. Mm. And it was a wife. Gosh, I can see him. He's got long hair. I'll make sure in the show notes he gets credit, okay? Yeah. Um, you're going to miss this. You're going to want this back. She's basically saying to the husband, get freaking present, dude. Mm. There, you know, two is a pain in the ass and two is going to be gone. Yeah. And then they're going to be to college. And you're going to be like, oh my God, how come we didn't snuggle? Yeah. You're going to miss this. And I, I'm welling up thinking about it because as a parent, I always held on to that song. I think mm. I was very aware of, I'll call it the fragility of that mm. moment in time. So I'll call yes. it like the evolution or the death of that age, right? Yeah, My absolutely. daughter was only two once, then mm-hmm. she was three, she's nine, right? That's right. And I think I got that really clear. What I didn't get was applying that to me and my fragility. Mm. I basically, um, put it on her. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Oh, totally get it. I'm hearing you right now. And so it's like giving so much to work, giving so much, you know, all the external stuff, but the, in the moments of, you know, that human connection with the people reporting to you, um, your customers, Mm -hmm. the board, you know, Mm -hmm. really having those types of connections is where the magic is. 
so that you can bring your best self forward and yet still be at that soccer game or with your ailing mother. Like this is everything. That's right. Well, and to explain why it's, it was easier to have your fragility primed by your daughter's life rather than your own. I mean, so, so for instance, for me right now, my 17 and a half year old has one more year at home. Yeah. So that horizon in our family's life is really close. So you're aware of the temporariness and fragility of it. Mm-hmm. I'm 44. Theoretically, I've got another 30 to 40 years. So that horizon is what, like, and I think Carstensen says this, when you, when you measure your horizon in decades, it feels like infinity basically to a, to a oh. human being. So, so for a kid though, and for their presence in your home, you know, that's the whole 18 summers sorts of, sort of concept, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you, that, that horizon always feels pretty close. So it makes sense that you would be reflecting on the temporariness of her yeah. in your life, but, but the value of being able to bring your own horizon closer yeah. and say, and ask the question, not, and I, the, I don't love the question. What would I do if this was the last day of my life? Cause the reality yeah. is I, w- I wouldn't go to work. I wouldn't pay the mortgage bills. <laughs> I, I honestly, probably, I'm like, that's just, a st- I go stupid question. Next, give stupid me question. I can really like reflect on and wake me so up. Here's, right? So here's what to reflect on is yeah. on the last day of your life. How will you have wished to live today? On the last day of your life, how will you have wished to live today? Because you, on the last day of your life, you won't say, well, I would have quit paying the mortgage because you needed to do that because you got another 30 or 40 years to live in this house mm-hmm. or whatever, right? But how would you have gone about this day? How would you have showed up to it in a way that reflects the values you'll have as you approach the end? Mm-hmm. Um, and so if we could be starting that each day with that question, not afraid of it, but guided by it, mm-hmm. um, I... I think we'd start to see immediate changes in the way that we structure our lives in the decisions we make on a day-to-day basis um, in the quality of our presence with our people, both at home and at work, frankly, Um, it would, it would, it would, it would elevate in both situations. Yeah. I, I mean, yesterday I had two executives I was working with and they were like, it's back to back. It's crazy. And, Mm -hmm. and I said, listen, you, you, we all have the same amount of time. Mm-hmm. everything isn't important. You got to figure out what the priorities are. Right. Yeah. And I can't do that for you. I can ask you the questions, mm-hmm. man. I wish I had that question yesterday. Well, right? and the, yeah. And the other I thing bring I, it tomorrow, you can bring it tomorrow. And yeah. well, and so what you just did, I love that because you, you didn't shame yourself for not having the question yesterday. You know, you said, Oh, just, this is, I learned something. I can do it tomorrow. And I think it's important to like, I, I hear a lot of shame from parents around like, oh, I should have appreciated those years more, you know, and this is where that habituation concept is so important. It's like, no, you have nothing to be ashamed of. You were wired to not pay attention to those years. <laughs> it, it's just that you weren't aware of how intentional you needed to be yeah. to be really present to them. And now that you, you do, yeah. you have a chance. Right? Yeah. So I'm going to ask you about the word companion for a minute because- mm. I'm inferring and I'm applying it in my own world that it's like any person I choose to be in relationship with. I'm Mm. not reserving companion for my spouse. Right. I mean, and I'm like, I think my daughter is my companion in in the relationship that we have. Yep. But so am I on the right track there? Like for those of us listening in, maybe there's a single mom, maybe there's people with no kids, maybe, you know, you're a widow and you just want to, you know, run your startup. Like, I don't know. It's why it's why I wrote this book, actually. Yeah, because I, I was originally encouraged and interested in the idea of writing a a, a marriage book, because I'm sort of known for that Mm -hmm. topic and writing. But I was really resistant to it. I didn't want to write another marriage book. um, And because I I didn't, I, I just marriage books seem to imply that if you're married, you're doing it right. And if you're not, you're not. And I just couldn't do it. I wanted to write about something that is a part of marriage, um, but a part of every other relationship as well. Mm -hmm. And, and so I wanted to write a book that married couples could look at and say, what if we quit trying to be better at being married and got better at being companions? What would that do for our marriage? But also Mm -hmm. like, that's true of friendship as well. What if we weren't just friends, but we were companions? What if we weren't just brother and sister, but we were companions? What if we just weren't mom and dad, but we were companions? And, and I think that's very different. I know we got a lot of caution around, you know, um, the parents being friends to their kids, because it usually right. means there's no boundaries and it's very yeah. permissive. But in companionship, there's lots of boundaries. 
there's the hard work of recognizing that I have boundaries and you have boundaries and together we're going to have to sort those out together. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do think it's very possible for parents. And I think it's actually important for us to be teaching our, our young people how to be companions. I'll give you an example. It might be an might be in the study guide. I'm not sure. Oh, I'll um, tell you if it is because I read it. <laughs> okay, it's uh, it was a story of a day where I was uh, having some back issues, ironically, um, and my wife was out shoveling some snow, and so I was inside making pancakes for breakfast. And my at the time probably 10 year old came out and he says, "What's for you know What's for breakfast?" I said, "Pancakes." But first, you need to go out and help your mom shovel the driveway. He's like, "I don't want to." Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, at first, I wanted to be like, "That's so self," you know, like what's for, you know. <laughs> And, and instead, I thought, this is a moment to teach him about companionship. Mm -hmm. And so I said to him, hey, dude, I'm going to love you no matter what. Your mom and I are going to keep giving you and doing good things for you all day today. But I want you to think about what it's like for us. If, if we are going to be giving you all of those good things and you don't want to join in to help us out with this with this one thing. I just want you to, because to me, that's teaching him about companionship. Companionship totally. is a, a giving and a receiving and an ebb and flow and a mutuality. And, uh, and sure enough, because he's, he's, he's got a good heart. And as soon as you point it out in that way, you know, a few minutes later, he's stomping out the door and he helps her shovel the driveway and plays in the snow for an hour, you know, before he gets his pancakes. And, and so I think, I think we have a responsibility to teach our kids companionship, but I think the principle and the idea is, it adds value to every relationship wherever we're at. Our, our employees are our companions. I mean, we're doing life with them. Um, yeah, and, I know. It brings a know, whole new name to work wife, doesn't it? You know, it, or work yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> yeah, right. Your story is in here. And I actually thought about it. Um, I want to double click on this for so mm -hmm. many reasons, because just as like society says, don't be friends with your kids. You always hear, don't be friends with your employees. Mm. And I love the concept of companion. Yes. This is why I'm asking you this question, because here's what I know. Here's what I know. Yeah. How many times did I tell people on my team, it's the right thing to do? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, but they don't give back and they don't this and they don't that. And, you know, we're always doing more and no, they don't care as much blah, 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 and all that. And I always went back to, it's the right thing to do, mm -hmm. you know, through the lens of customer, through the lens of profit, right. through the lens of productivity, mm -hmm. but I never had it through the lens of companion. And yeah. yet I know when we did what I said was the right thing to do, we built a reciprocity. That's right. Um, with the other people. And I always looked at it through like the lens of Robert Cialdini's influence, right? Mm. The, the principle of reciprocity. And that was what was driving me. But what you just described is reciprocity it in is. relationship. That's right. That's I exactly right. I freaking love this right now. <laughs> That's you, right. Oh my God. Yeah. It's about companionship. So yes, I think I, I stand firm on this today with everything I know. Mm. And I've always thought friendship at work meant something, you know, all the research says you need a friend at work. That's right. You're lonely. Mm -hmm. Look at my face. If, if anyone's watching the video, watch my face. On <laughs> but I think you need lots of companions at work in yes. order to move the needle. If you want high performance the principles you describe in this book can get you there. I mean, that's, that's right. the foundation. If you take that protective layer off, you embrace your own loneliness and it's not someone else's problem. And then you recognize it's the moments that matter. That's like right. How many leaders are just focused on numbers and not their people right now? Mm -hmm. that's how right. many people, how many women are leaving the workforce right now because mm. it's, it's not sustainable? That's right. And all they want to do is say, I need some flexibility. Can we do it this way? You know, and, but they don't talk about it because it doesn't feel safe. And That's then right. here we are. I, th yeah. I think this is, I am so glad you brought this to the world, um, Kelly. I'm so grateful. Well, and what I'm hearing from you is that what I'm hearing from you, and I really appreciate it is um, it gives, it, it gives leaders a way um, to value and to work on relationships in the workplace um, in a way that doesn't have to feel um, unboundaried, yes. um, sort of relationally permissive. Yes. Um, that you still, you know, you're, there's certain expectations, there's certain boundaries, there's certain requirements. This mm -hmm. is what we've got to do. Um, but I can still cultivate relationship with you in the context of that. And the, and the name for that is, yeah, is companionship. Dude. Yeah. Yeah. There's your subtitle of your next one. We, we can talk. I can. I'll write it forward. <laughs> there you and go. This, this is, this is game changing. Um, 
what you've done and what you've opened up through my own lens. And I'm so glad we're here. And I want to give you the floor to talk about anything that you think is relevant right now um, Mm. on any, I don't care which companion you want to talk about. I want your passion Mm. to come through on, you know, why you wrote the book and what your hope is. And I want to, I just want to give you the floor to soapbox Mm. it for a minute, you know? Mm. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, So I, my, I think we are naturally so, I think we, we easily want to give up on our humanity. Um, I think the thing that I've been, that I feel most joy in is the idea of taking the hard parts of our humanity and actually seeing that they can be put to work for us, that they're not broken, that they're not um, we don't need to cut them out, get rid of them, eliminate them, you know? And, and so to be hearing right now and to be getting emails from folks who are saying, I feel not liberated from my loneliness, but liberated for my loneliness that like, this is transforming the way that I look at my relationships. Um, that to me, just to hear those stories, I mean, I'm a therapist, you know, from the beginning. And so to hear the stories that are being changed and the lives that are being changed by these ideas um, is just so exciting for me. Um, And so to hear your excitement too, like I just, it's a blessing, you know? Um, And, and so I just, I just feel grateful to have been able to put my words out into the world and, uh, and see the, see the change that's happening and to get to just enjoy watching that happen. It's, uh, I feel very blessed. Oh, being well, human I, is a good, being human is a good thing. Being, you being, know what? And I'm just going to say being human, I was working on a project specifically about, you know, addressing the problem of women leaving the workforce. And you guys, yeah. I wrote an email to Kelly and I'm like, uh, I've been reading your blog for a long time <laughs> and I've kind of been watching your work through the stuff you do with the dad's groups that I know about. And I want to make sure I've got the male perspective. Can I have 30 minutes? Like I was, imagine if I hadn't had the courage to be human to ask right. for help. Yep. Right. That's I right. mean, talk about human and I'm, I'm going to toot my horn. I, I was scared shitless. I'm like, he's going to be like, Oh yeah. Who's this Yahoo who wants my time for free. Right. Yeah. But I, I knew we had enough in common that mm-hmm. if I didn't ask, it was one of those I'd regret it. And Oh my yeah. gosh, my well, life changed. Well, there, I mean, you turned, you turned feeling a little bit lost and confused about what to do into yeah. like something Mm -hmm. really yeah so that's I just love that like if we aren't afraid of those moments if we can embrace them and move towards them you know they become our teachers and by the way it's so funny to me to think that you'd be scared of me (laughs) (laughs) I'm I'm like a I'm like a frightened little puppy dog myself like aren't we all yes when you're lonely and you're shamed if I use your word the shame's coming like I feel lonely because I don't have my PhD who am I to blah 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 that's right and I thought who am I not to like he can say no he can have his own boundary yeah. And we had a blast that 30 minutes. We didn't had we? A I think blast. both of us. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Well, that's how we ended up here. That's right. I mean, my, yeah. everyone's benefiting because you brought this into the world and I didn't even know the book was coming out when I reached out. Like it's right. divine. Yes. Um, and I, I'm just, yeah, you guys, you need to go get the book. Okay. And study guide, like no joke. He writes it in a way that he, he tells you how to do it. So you don't have to be dependent. I mean, if you want to talk about a legacy, Mm-hmm. Right. And helping people do it on their own time in their own way. Your, yeah. your study guy. I mean, you guys look at my marks. Fabulous. Fabulous. Thank I you. loved it. I mean, talk, you, bring Lisa. it into a team meeting people bring it into a team yeah. meeting. You want the idea? Session? Yeah. The mm-hmm. idea is that each, uh, each of the five sessions is meant to trigger three, three great conversations each with yeah. amongst you and your people. Love and yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so how do people find you? Okay. I'm going to ask you two questions. Mm-hmm. I'm going to make sure they know how to find you. Cause we are going to make sure everybody can get to you. And then the second, okay. cause they won't be, don't need to be afraid. Like I was. So, <laughs> um, and then the second thing is I'm building a playlist because one of the things that I feel very strongly about, and I know in my heart of hearts, music raises vibrations. Mm-hmm. And especially when you're feeling lonely mm-hmm. or your shame's kicking in and making you feel crappy for being human. Mm-hmm. Um, there are certain songs that people have on their go-to that really elevate them and have them step into mm-hmm. the seeing themselves in a, in a brighter yeah. light or, you know, stepping into their own power. Yep. So how do people find you and what's your go-to song? That's like my favorite question I've ever had. I write to music um, and I wrote the whole book to a certain playlist. 
Uh, Are you serious? And I bet there's a way. Yeah, I'm sure I could share the, is, if people have Apple Music at least, I could share the playlist with you and they could just click on the link and get access to the playlist, right? And that, Look at that's me. possible. Because I, yeah. we didn't even know we had this in common. A playlist is everything. Oh, Freaking it's everything. awesome. Um, okay. Yeah, so, I mean, I'll tell you the first song from the playlist that came to mind. Um, yeah. It's It's got a pretty diverse range of music on it, but it's a song called Grow As We Go by Benjamin Platt, I think is his name. He Grow was the dear grow as we go he's the dear evan hansen guy um so yeah ben platt grow as we go i think it's a beautiful song it's got a song on there by a group called penny and sparrow uh called don't want to be without you um which is a clever song about reincarnation and if i have to come back as like a like a, a barrette i'll do that to be in your hair it's just a cute oh, little that's song. awesome but anyways there's a lot of fun songs on here um and yeah i'll share the playlist with you that's awesome so if you were to pick one is it the grow as we go or is I, it... I, it would be oh that's sort of sappy if i have to pick one uh-huh oh it'd be i mean it, the first song on the playlist is is closed hand full of friends by foy vance closed why, hand why that why that song uh because that it's song that does to, for does for you because it's um it's about going on a journey and that as long as you have friends to go with you you know you'll you'll sort it out you you can rejoice in in the presence of your companions on the way and it's a fantastic yeah. song so I, I listen to it a lot i can't wait to listen to this okay how do how do you want people to find you I mean, I stalked you, of course. They don't need to be that, <laughs> have to be that shy, right? Yes. Well, people can come to my website, which is drkellyflanagan.com, drkellyflanagan.com. If they want to stick around and be on my email list and get my monthly, uh, I call it my help letter, because I try to never deliver an email that doesn't have help in it, um, is uh, you can go to the top right corner right now, and there's a, a button that says, get your guide. And they're going to get a 52-week guide for walking through worthiness, belonging, and purpose. And each week has a reading and a practice for the week. Uh, and so I think it's really helpful and useful. Um, and then they'll be on the email list. So drkellyflanagan.com for that. If they're interested in True Companions, they can go to truecompanionsbook.com, truecompanionsbook.com, and uh, find out more about it and, and, and go from there. But it's available wherever books are sold. So I just love it. You guys, run, don't walk. Serious. <laughs> so sweet. Thank you. No, I'm serious. <laughs> You know, I was joking with Kelly that I'm like, Oprah, I just have to read this. And I thought, no, <laughs> I, you know, everybody knows who knows me or listens to me or engages with me knows <clears throat> I don't hold back mm. when, when it's something that I, I'm a huge ambassador when something connects like this did. Yeah. And I'm so grateful for you saying yes to that crazy email I wrote. <laughs> I'm so grateful um, to have had the lead time to actually read this before we did this mm -hmm. podcast. Yeah. Um, and I am, um, I'm inspired and I'm hopeful and I, you guys, Dr. Kelly Flanagan.com, you want to make it happen and true companions. Here it is the again. Feeling, one time. The, the feeling is so mutual. I'm, I'm, oh. I'm blessed by this connection with you. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Well, yep. make it a great day. Listen to the songs. We'll get the playlist in the show notes too. Yep. And, uh, know that you're not alone. And lonely, to be lonely is to be human, right? You got, oh, to be lonely is to be human. That's a great way to end it. Full circle. I love it. All uh -huh. right. Thanks, everybody. Yep.